How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Ballaholics, the show where we talk all things basketball and sports going on around the world. Uh, one of the biggest things basketball related that actually has come up uh, is the Jimmy Butler trade to Philadelphia. Um, you know, what was your guys' reaction? Honestly, I'm going to say this from now. Philadelphia is going to the finals, baby. <laughs> Stop it. Jimmy Stop Butler it. is an offensive powerhouse. He's a leader. What? Oh, he's a leader. What the 76ers desperately need. He's one of the best defenders in the, in the league right now. And there's the 76ers, you can't tell me that they're not so much closer to the championship than they were right the day before. Sorry. Yeah. Here's my problem I have with that, Dante. People like you. Okay, listen. Like I know the 76ers had to do something. You know, they've been trying to lure a superstar in for a while now. Right. They struggled with Paul George. They struggled with LeBron James. They couldn't get Kawhi Leonard. So, you know, it makes sense. I understand why they did it. And, they, you know, they want to get another superstar. Here is the problem I have with this trade. I am looking at fit. Now, Marco Fultz and Ben Simmons are both very ball-dominant, you know, people. They cannot play off the ball, a.k.a. none of them can shoot. Ben Simmons has no jump shot. Marco Fultz, like, can't shoot threes. He can't even make his free throws, which I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that now. I don't even want to get to that. But Jimmy Butler is another ball-dominant player. So putting him on the, on the same team, it's just not going to work. Look. Houston has proved, you know, I used to say that, like, you can't have more than one ball-dominant player on a team. Mm -hmm. But Houston proved that wrong to me. You know, Chris Paul and James Harden, they're able to play. The reason why they're able to play together, though, is because they can both play off the ball and they both have nice shots. They can both shoot. Marco Fultz, Ben Simmons cannot shoot, and therefore, I don't see that team being as good. I'm not going to say that they're not going to get better. Of course, having Jimmy Butler on your team is going to give you more wins for sure. But I still, quite, I still put them below Toronto. I still put them below Boston. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I even put them below Milwaukee as well. Really? One thing, one factor that you're not factoring in whatsoever is that how badly these guys want to win. If they want this to fit, it's going to fit. Jimmy Butler is a natural leader. Look at their lineup. They, they, they move Marco Fultz back to the bench, and they put Jimmy Butler in. That's a killer lineup. That, I don't see. That's just going to destroy me. So what, what, what's, what's happening with Marco Fultz, though? I'd say that he comes off with the back. He plays with the second unit. I think I think that they want him to play him right now this season. They want to make him get some confidence, which I want him to do, to play in the starting lineup, but it's just not working. I still have faith in him. A lot of people call him a bust. I don't think he's a bust. I think he's good. He can't shoot. Save his life. <laughs> However, well, that's, that's definitely going to hinder his development. Like, putting Jerry Butler there is going to hinder Marco Fultz's development, you know. And what's going to happen, like, when Jerry Butler has the ball in his hands, like, I'm still, I'm going back to the fit. What is Ben Simmons doing with the ball? When, what is he going to do when Jerry Butler has the ball in his hands? Well, I think I think your argument goes two ways. Because I, if you can if you think about it this way, putting a star player like Jimmy Butler on a team with young guys will help them grow. Jimmy Butler's a guy with many years of experience. Um, you know, I guess you can call the LeBron effect. Not to say that he's at the same level no, as LeBron. Don't even, don't even. Um, I do, <laughs> no, I do stop, believe stop right that now. putting. I, okay, let, let me let me continue because I do believe that putting Jimmy Butler on this team will help them individually to some extent. However, on the other side of things. I do think that it sort of hurt Philly uh, in the sense that looking at the trade and what was what went down, um, Philadelphia gave up Dario Saric, Robert Covington, Jared Bayless, and a pick for Jimmy Butler and one of the players, Justin Patton. Um, I think that that comes at a huge loss to Philly as far as their depth is concerned. Uh, watching Robert Covington play, who is rather, you know, he, he's a quality player. I don't think he's a superstar, but I think he's a player that can give a lot, you know, coming off the bench, starting occasionally. I think that's very helpful for their team, also with Dario Saric. These guys aren't superstars, but they're quality players. These are players that have fit into Philly's system, players that have been there for multiple years, and players that know the ropes. Players that, you know, given the scenario that they're in with the players that they have, Joel Embiid, Marco Fultz, Ben Simmons, they know their role. They are guys who fit well. Ben Simmons can't shoot. I agree. But Robert Covington and Dario Saric, when given the ball from a guy who can distribute as well as Ben Simmons, who can distribute as well as Marco Fultz, can get the ball in the basket. And I think that's something that's very important that Philadelphia is losing with this trade. Okay, let me just, I need to just talk both you guys first off, because mm -hmm. you guys, let me get this straight, you guys are calling Jimmy Butler a leader. Yes. Yes. I'm just curious, like, what happened in Minnesota with Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns? He was with guys who just didn't want to win. And what happened yeah. in Chicago? What happened in Chicago? It, it wasn't just didn't and work out. are you going to call, in fact, do you think calling out your players through social media is being a leader? I think that's absolutely wrong. I feel like, we you know, again, like I talked about this before, you know, Whatever happens in the locker room stays in the locker room. You don't go out to the media. That is not what a leader does. That is not what LeBron James does. LeBron James elevates his teammates. They don't, they don't make them play worse. When Jimmy Butler was in, on Minnesota, 
Chicago Town stats were not as good as they were as as they were supposed to be. And just because of that alone, because of you know the actual in the game playmaking, you like with Carlton Towns averaging less points than Wiggins, along with off the court as well, I just don't believe he's a leader, and I don't believe he's anywhere even close to LeBron James in terms of leadership skills and obviously you know skills in general. I think it, I think it also comes down to question you know the the attitudes of the players on that team. You know obviously we looked at the team last year. We saw Jeff Teague. We saw you know Towns. We saw Wiggins. We saw Butler. And everyone went, oh, this team is going to do really well. But if you think about, I guess, their individual attitudes towards the team spirit, towards that mentality that, you know, yes, I'm a great player, but I need to give in to let other people, you know, gain that ground so we can do well together, maybe that didn't work out in Minnesota. Maybe that's the reason why it fell apart. And I think personally that in Philadelphia, again, agreeing with Dante, saying that there's a mindset to win. That's a team that wants to win. That's a team that's been in the dark, you know, for a very long time. Um, that has quote unquote tanked, that's brought, you know, not, not great years, not great records to Philly, who wants to come back. We've seen resurgence in the last couple seasons. And the addition of Butler only adds fuel to that fire. It's a city that wants to win. Cannot deny that. It is a city that wants to win. How do you guys think Minnesota actually did in that part of the trade? Because we never really got to, you know, talk about them. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys think they did? Well, to your point. When Jimmy Butler was not on the court, I don't have the exact stats. I don't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure Anthony, Andrew Wiggins and Carl J. Towns, their numbers were way better without Jimmy Butler on the court with them every time he didn't play. Exactly. So like on their end, I think Jimmy Butler is a good player, but if, 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 like you said, if it fits not, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And it seems like they play much better without him. So I feel like they're I just, yeah. in a good place. Sorry, I just can't go over the fact that you're Minnesota. You got offered, you know, reportedly you got offered four first round picks from Houston. And don't forget, you know, the way the first round picks work now, that like you cannot trade consecutive years. Right. So that means that um, Minnesota could have had possibly a 2025 first round pick. Mm -hmm. And for me, I don't believe Houston's going to be, you know, you, there's no like telling if Houston's going to be this good, you know, come 2025. And they're, they're struggling right now, but we're not going to get to that right now. But I just feel like you had four first round picks. Covington's a good player, he's a solid player, two way mm -hmm. player. Um, Darius Sarek, another great player. Right. But four first round picks. I just feel like Minnesota could have done a lot better. Right. That being said, I believe that this was great and that you had to get rid of Jimmy Butler. Mm -hmm. Because you, you weren't winning now anyway. And right. your franchise player is Carl Anthony Towns. Right. And you gotta make you gotta do whatever it takes to make that guy happy. Because agree. he is your franchise. Exactly. No, I, I do agree with that. Totally agree with that. Uh, looking at the contract that he signed, you know, looking at the way that they built their offense, you know, in, in Minnesota. In my personal opinion, I think Jimmy Butler's time in Minnesota was an experiment. It was, he wanted to get out of Chicago, he went to Minnesota, and they tried to make it work, and obviously, unfortunately, it didn't work as well as people planned. You know, that happens, that happens in basketball. I mean, we don't want it to happen as, you know, as a franchise owner, you know, as a star player on this team, you don't want your team to fail. Yeah. But sometimes it does, and, you know, I, I do think that this is a good trade uh, for both parties. I think that Philadelphia gets a good player, a player that can work with, a player that can lead them to the, you know, loses extent of the word, uh, and Minnesota uh, gains pieces that can help them solidify their, their team, solidify their depth, and continue to work around the young core that they have. I guess like the last point I want to make is just like, let's just look at the injury history, you know, with the Philadelphia 76ers, they have right. so many injury problems. I mean, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, mm -hmm. Marco Fultz over the years, and now you're adding someone else with really bad injury history in Jimmy Butler. Mm -hmm. So that's just another point I wanted to bring up because right. that is huge. I mean, yes. that's just, it's just such an injury prone team. So right. you just have to hope that they all play healthy and they're all, they're all healthy. You, well, know? Yeah. You, you can't predict, you know, you cannot predict that. Mm -hmm. And that's not, you know, I'm not saying that's, that's why Philadelphia had a bad trade, but I'm just saying that's a risk that you have to take for sure. That's true. All right, moving on, I want to talk about something uh, that has been on my mind lately that's been all over ESPN and other new sports outlets. Um, Duke basketball, the 2018 Monstars, the team that, as far as I've seen, has blown every other college basketball team they've played out of the water. Uh, Sam, where do we start with this? I mean, look, they are—they really are the Monstars of Space Jam. I mean, this team is the war. They're like the Warriors of college basketball. When you put three top five, you know, draft picks possibly, and Zion Williamson, Cam Reddish, and R.J. Barrett on the same team, and then you let you let them, you let um. But if you let the prestigious coach, Coach K, coach them, this team is going to be, they're, you know they're going to be good. I mean, this team is crazy good. I mean, they beat Kentucky, the number two C at the time, by 34 points. They blew them out of the water. Yes, they did. And like, when I think of Zion, like, he's a freak of nature, this guy. He 
he is, you know, 6'7", 285 pounds. Once he gets into the NBA, he's going to be the second heaviest player right. in the game. Right. I mean, and this guy, like, not only is he big and he has strength, he had, you know, not to mention, like, LeBron James never had this strength, you know, right. at this, in this right. stage of, you yes. know. And this dude's explosive, too. I, I'm sure you guys have seen his highlights. I mean, they're just incredible. I, I think he has something along the lines of a 40 inch vertical, which yeah. is crazy. I mean, thinking about it, this guy is <laughs> built like... Honestly, one of the bigger NFL football players you'll see. He can be an NFL player. Yeah, he's, he's a straight up backer. He's just straight up bigger than everyone, stronger than everyone, faster than everyone. It's like insane. Yeah. Bigger, yeah. faster, stronger. One okay. of the things about Zion Williamson that really, um, really amazes me is so obviously I watched his, his high, college, nah, high school highlights, his uh, you know his travel highlights, AAU, whatever you know, just stuff on YouTube and clips that I've seen that have been put out. Um, and in high school, obviously the skill level gap can go from like almost level to like extreme. Like you can see, you know, D1 prospects playing against kids who played for, you know, one year of their life. Um, and that skill level is huge. And part of me, while watching Zion's highlights, went, you know, this guy's really talented. This guy is athletic. This guy is awesome. He's strong. He can finish with the ball. You know, he can dunk, which is amazing. He can throw windmills in a high school game. He can dunk. And this guy is going to do amazing in college. You know, he's a perfect fit. And then another part of me went, you know, this guy is playing against competition, you know, that isn't at that level. You know what I mean? Um, thinking about, you know, how he plays and the way that he plays. You know, oh, he, he likes to drive to the basket a lot. He doesn't really shoot as often. He uh, gets a lot of blocks because the people that he plays against are, you know, way smaller than he is. Um, you know, he, he's at times there have been times that he struggles with shooting, um, and a lot of the time that he can muscle his way to the paint and get a dunk is because the guys that he plays against are again sizably different than he is. Um, however, you know, that was my premonition, seeing him go to college, but, you know, it's amazing. Again, why I'm so amazed with Zion Williamson is that his abilities have translated directly into his college game, which is fantastic. For a player who is 6'7", 285, who has worked on all of his strengths, who has put time and effort into making himself a better player and translating it immediately into his college career, seeing him drop 20 points every night, you know, and dunking and, you know, doing things with ease and even improving on his shooting. I see him, you know, take shots all over the paint, all over the, all over the floor, outside the arc, inside the arc, and he'll hit a, a good amount of them, which is amazing for a player like him. Um, and I think it only gets better. I'm really happy. I'm excited to see how he does. I'm really excited to see how the other guys do. Right? For sure. But let's, let's, let me just stay on the line for a sec, because I want mm -hmm. you ready for these stats, guys? I, I, I have to get this out. This dude is averaging 25 points and 10 rebounds, which wow. are great stats, obviously. Right. On only 13 shots, 13 shots. Mm -hmm. His field goal percentage is over 80%. Yep. That is incredible. You never incredible. see a player. I, I've never seen a player in the NBA or anywhere averaging, you know, those stats with such efficiency. I right. mean, yeah. he is such a good player. Like you know, like like you said, Tyro. Like right. there, are so, there are a lot of players that like get so much hype in high school and mm -hmm. they come to you know college or even the NBA. It just doesn't work. Like you know, like Andrew Wiggins. You know, obviously, mm -hmm. I feel like he's an underachiever in that regard, but. This design, not only is he so explosive, mm -hmm. but he's very skilled as well. Like he's right. a very he can ball handle, he can handle the ball. Right. He's also really good at passing and finding mm -hmm. his teammates as well. Exactly. And you know, the way you were saying, you know, Cam Reddish, another great player, 6'8". Right. I mean, he, he doesn't need the ball in his hands all the time. Mm -hmm. but this dude can shoot. I mean, he can shoot the lights out. And when I last checked, he was averaging 23 points on 43% shooting, and that's not bad at all. Yeah. I mean, not bad at all. And of course, the most most skilled player, you know, R.J. Barrett. Right. He's such a strong finisher. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a crazy finisher. Putting all those three players together, like that. If that was in the NBA, like that would be a dynasty. I feel that like. could be a dynasty. It I could be. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go too far because it's right. only college. But like, it it's looking really good. It's looking right. very good for Duke. Yeah. And again, under the guidance of Mike Krzyzewski, you know, a coach who has won countless medals with USA, who has won countless NCAA championships with Duke. Um, you know, him being their mentor, who can only help them grow further, you know, these guys are fantastic players, and having him as a role model, having him as the guy who makes them exceed their potential and prepare them for the NBA, because I'm sure these guys are going to go one and done. I think they're going to go right to the NBA after the season, you know, credit to them for having that skill level, for having the ability, um, and I think it's a good look for them if, if they can make it to the NBA, because they can. I do believe that these three guys have what it takes to get to the NBA. I'm sure not many people doubt that. You know, everyone is a believer in Zion Williamson, in Cam Reddish, and RJ Barrett. And I'm so excited to see how this goes. And you know, obviously we it's a long college season. They can you know, undefeated. They can go undefeated. They can win the title. That's true. Well, you know, again, it's a long college season. 
Um, you never know how things like uh, how games go in the college season. Uh, we look obviously last year. We saw Buffalo beat Arizona. We saw you know Virginia lose to UMBC. Um, you know crazy things happen in in the NCAA. And honestly, I if I could make a pick right now for who would win, I would go Duke. Um, I feel like it's the obvious choice, but again. We don't know what's going on. There's so much uncertainty with college hoops, which is amazing, which is why I like watching college hoops. Um, just because it's just there. Uh, but we'll see, obviously, how it goes, how it pans out during the season. Um, best of luck to these guys, honestly. And, Dr., what do you think? Sab 5 level? No. No? no? Like, <laughs> these guys, they're nice. With Jimmy King, Jalen Rose, Chris Weber, Ray Jackson. I don't know, Dr. No. I don't know. Sab 5 got them. No, if there's any matchup I can see right now, I want to see the Fab Five take on this Duke team. That would be fun. And let yeah. me just say this. I know it's so hard to, like, you know, predict. It's so hard to predict college basketball just because, right. like, you know, there's so many upsets, like, you know, Virginia last year. Right, right. But if there's any team that I'm going to predict that will go undefeated, it's going to be this Duke team. It's okay. going to be this Duke team. I'm sure. Okay. I mean, yeah, look, looking at other prospects in the league, Bull Bull out in um, Oregon. Uh, a bunch of other, you know, there's a lot of teams with a lot of talent, but I mean, Bobo especially, Sharif O'Neal, UCLA, uh, guys who also dominate the game. I would really love to see a matchup between these two teams. I'm sure we're going to see one at some point this season um, and see how all these guys perform under that level of pressure will really make or break, uh, you know, their season and how that all ends. And especially after watching their performances since the start of the season um, is the <laughs> garbage fire that is the Washington Wizards. <laughs> Apparently, recently, the Wizards have expressed openness to, you know, trading their players, all their players, you know, even guys like John Wall and Bradley Beal. Um, and there have been, you know, apparently reports of heated altercations between players, uh, you know, really bad culture in the locker room. And I just want to see what you guys think about that. Honestly, what's happening with the Wizards is <clears throat> truly a disgrace. Scott Brooks, great coach. I like him, but I think he needs to go. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the whole entire team needs to go and they need to just start a rebuilding phase. Because, yeah. like, let, let me give you some stats. Okay. There are 26 in the league in offensive efficiency, 28th in defensive efficiency. Wow. That's they're great. averaging out They're getting outscored every night by 10.3 points per game. They're 31 percent from three. Oh. That's the fourth worst in the NBA. They have no chemistry. Mm -hmm. And truly, what I think, I think that this team should have been blown up last season, mm -hmm. or maybe even the season before that. Right. Because now. The league is looking around, and you see John Wall is not playing that well. Mm -hmm. Bradley Beal's not playing that well. The team, they don't have chemistry. I hear reports that they don't hang out after. They're not that good friends. And now that their trade value is just getting lower and lower. Sure. And like before they had, before people look at John, John Wall, I think I think he's nice. I think he could ball. He's definitely an all-star. Superstar, maybe not. Bradley Beal, he easily ball. All those players on the team, they were, they're tradable. And maybe they're still tradable. They can definitely get some picks for them. Maybe some players start, start rebuilding. But I just think that's what needs to happen. I think this team needs needs a major overlook right now. What do you think, Seth? Is the chemistry like is the chemistry bad? It definitely is. Is the talent bad there? Not at all. This mm -hmm. team, I project them to be like top five seed in the Eastern right. Conference or top six perhaps. I'm not even sure. But this team has two superstars in John Wall and Bradley Beal. Have they had difficulties in the past? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know what they need? They don't need to blow it all up. They need to get the culture. They need culture. They need right. leadership. Obviously, Scott Brooks is not a leader. He, he should go. Head coach has to go. I like Scott Brooks, too. I thought that I agree with you. He has to go. And now, if we looked at the Washington Wizards in 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. let's notice something. Why do you think they were so good? They had Paul Pierce. Again, not the most talented player at the time, but he was a veteran. He brought culture. He brought the winning culture, and that's what they need. They need to get rid of these low-character players, maybe like maybe Dwight Howard, Trey Dwight Howard, and they need to instill the, the winning culture. Right. So they need to... Um, Try and trade maybe Vince Carter on the Atlanta Hawks, great player. Maybe Jason Terry. They need they need to bring in a veteran. They need to bring in some veterans. Right. They need to get a new coach. Mm -hmm. they need to, in the head coach, they need to find a leader. Right. A leader head coach. Now, who I'm looking at? I'm looking at the Spurs assistant coach who has been around Coach Pop for six years. Okay. And I'm gonna go with with his name is Udo. Um, he he's a great he's a great coach. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I mean Udoka. I, apo I apologize. I mean Udoka. He's been under Greg Popovich's wing mm -hmm. for six years. Mm -hmm. Talk about culture. Why right. not take someone right from the San Antonio Spurs, who's like the most the best team in terms of culture? Right. Another player I'm thinking about. Sorry, not another player. 
Another coach that I'm thinking about, this one's a, this one's a hot pick. Mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm looking at Kentucky. I'm looking at John Calipari. Really? Let's look, let's look back. John okay. Calipari coached John Wall a couple years ago. Yeah. Once upon a time, he also coached the Marcus Cousins. He did. I feel like the Wizards, they fix up the culture, and they bring in another star player like the Marcus Cousins. They're literally one good head coach and one the Marcus Cousins away from being a contender in the East. See, okay. Sam, that's where I disagree with you, actually. You bring in Jason Terry, Vince Carter, great guys. They would help coaches in a normal situation. But just because they come in doesn't mean that everyone's going to become friends. Doesn't mean that the right. team's going to go smoothly. Doesn't mean they're going to play any better right. on the court. I just don't see this happening. Maybe last, maybe um, last season, maybe the season before that, before Paul George. Excuse me, Chris. Excuse me, Paul Pierce. Left. What are you doing? <laughs> before Paul Pierce left. That's when they was looking. They should have been looking for more veterans. But besides that, I, I just don't, I just don't see this team. I don't see any change that's gonna make this team better. I see another coach, a new a new coach comes in. Let's say let's say hypothetically a new coach comes in. Right. Dwight Howard leaves, mm -hmm. and they have a new big man. Anyone? Let's just any any player. Not Marcus Gortat. <laughs> <laughs> they had it. Just is, does the, how much does the team really change? I personally feel that didn't change the team that much. Mm -hmm. I agree with it. I do agree with it because, like, yeah, I, I mean, you know, one person can only say so much. You know, bringing in a great coach, bringing in, you know, a good player to replace Dwight Howard, um, you know, whatever. Whoever whoever gets replaced, whether it's a single player, whether it's a coach, whatever it may be, one person I don't think will change everything. I feel like, yes, the coach can say, run sprints because you guys suck, you know, or, or like, you know, try to instill, you know, team values in a team that doesn't have those values. They can try, they can say what they want to, they can try to enforce these by any means necessary, but is this going to have an immediate effect on the roster? I don't think so. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I guess after hearing all of this, I do kind of side with the fact that we should blow, they should blow the roster up. But John Wall Bradley um, two All-Stars? You should throw that away. I mean, again, uh, going back to what Dante said about losing trade value because of the fact that they're performing poorly this season, because of the fact that their poor performances stem from the lack of chemistry in the locker room, from the lack of chemistry between you know, players and coaches, between players and players, and just all of that, you know, I feel like it's important that they look at themselves and go, this isn't working. We need to change everything as soon as we can. See, I would agree with you, I, would, I will agree with you, mm -hmm. if and when they trade for a veteran player and they fire their head coach and bring someone else in and it's unsuccessful. But until then, I feel like you, you at least owe an attempt to try and keep this together. This court, John Wall, Bradley Beal, two All-Stars, possibly the best backcourt in the East. I mean, that John Wall, Bradley Beal, two All-Stars, I feel like it's a really good backcourt. I wouldn't get rid of that right now. You have so much talent. Why waste it? Make an attempt to trade for a veteran, fire the head coach, and if it doesn't work then, then maybe blow it all up. But for now, I feel like there's too much talent to do that with, mm -hmm. and it's, 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 it, would be, it would be hard for me to do that, honestly. You know what, you know what I see? Yeah. I see John Wall, he's bigger, he's mm -hmm. bigger now. His, own, his trade value is definitely lower than it was last, last season. And, and if it continues like this, it's only gonna be lower. And the, the opportunities they'll have to blow the team up and actually get a winning culture going in Washington, D.C., is not gonna get very much. I'm gonna tell you about John Wall's contract, and I'm gonna preference that he does not have the worst contract <laughs> on the Washington Wizards. He is on a, he signed to a five-year mm -hmm. max deal with the Wizards for okay. like $84 million per year. Okay. No, excuse me, $84 million five-year contract. Okay. With, get this, a player option. Oh. The, the, the management in Washington, they, they, need to, they need to practice. They need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, is the, do, do the individual players' trade value actually go down? I believe they do to a certain extent, but John Wall is still averaging like 20, 20 points, eight assists. He's still, they're still individually playing very well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when it comes to trade value, I feel like that plays a huge role. I mean, look at DeMarcus Cousins when he got traded for Sacramento, like mm -hmm. he had great stats and like his trade value didn't, I, I didn't see his trade value decrease necessarily because of the bad situation he's in. So I'm, I'm just questioning like the extent, I feel like you're, you guys are weighing the trade value a little too much, and I feel you're you're, you're underestimating the you know the talent that this team has and the potential they have in the East. Because without you know just raw talent, right. they're they're a top five team in the East. Right. And if they were to add, you know, I know I'm repeating myself, but if they were to add another player like the Marcus Cousins and maybe sign John John Calipari, I feel like they can get this whole thing figured out. Mm -hmm. And my only other team, one more thing: Do you mean trading both John Wall, Bradley Beal, or are you keeping one of them and trading the other? 
Um, you go first. If you, what do you think? I say train them both. Train them both. Train them both. Get a whole new team, whole new coach. <laughs> Maybe the coach can stay if you if you trade them both, and just get a bunch of picks, get some players you can work with. There needs to be a big culture change there. I I say more than coach. There just needs to be a change in Washington. I I would hope within the next two seasons that that team is almost completely different, mm -hmm. in a different path. Maybe they're like straddling eighth seed, struggling to get into the playoffs. Mm -hmm. But like I think that's better than staying staying complacent with what you have now. You right. Your two all stars, which you do have, right? Undeniable all stars. These guys can ball. But like, what's the point of having these two all stars and you've been in the same spot for the last four seasons? I agree. I do think that's a pretty good idea. Both players. Both players. But, you know what? Honestly, the way that it works is we'll see how it pans out. Um, maybe they'll blow the team up. Maybe they'll, you know, find a veteran, trade for one player. But you never know. We'll see how the season goes. Um, anyway. I said, well, I just have one thing I got to add. Because they have a bad record, obviously. And this is going to give them another good lottery pick. They're going to get another very good draft pick. But I just want to add that quickly in there. So an all-star, a new coach, and a draft pick, a top three draft pick, maybe Zion. I'm just, uh, I'll take I'm just saying. <laughs> All right. Now to take our minds off the Wizards, it's time for what you doing. Yeah. Basically, I'm sure you guys know, but just in case, I'll explain it again. Basically, we just look at bloopers all around the NBA and just basically roast NBA players. Yeah. So number one, we got Lonzo Ball. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Has he worked on his shoe? Oh my god. <laughs> I mean, I thought he worked on his shooting over the summer. I'm sure he has worked on his shooting. Oh no, he has not. <laughs> Hasn't really paid off too well. <laughs> oh my god, that was terrible. Number two, the Washington Wizards. No. Back Washington. to the Wizards. What's this is going on here. Oh my god. This basically summarizes up their season. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this, trying to. Oh my. Oh my goodness! It didn't even go out of bounds. Oh my goodness! I couldn't even inbound the ball. Did that not get called? Oh my god! Uh, I think it did. Not it once, did. not once, oh but twice, god. but twice. That, that's <laughs> I'm a change. I'm sorry. Like I was so happy, but then like I saw that. You know, <laughs> I was trying to take my mind off the Wizards, and I just saw that, and now I'm just. <laughs> okay, let's get to the next one. Yep. The Washington Wizards again. Yeah. Oh, this is. Oh my god, Dwight Howard. Oh, <laughs> what did he do? Oh. <laughs> Oh, right off the backboard, oh, right off the side of the backboard. He was close, he hit the backboard. Yeah. I mean, look, Dwight Howard was never known for a shot. Oh my god. I feel like he still isn't known for a shot oh my after that god. one. So okay. <laughs> so we got one more left? One more, and this is not the wizard psych god, <laughs> but it's Markel Fultz, and it is his free throw shot. Let's take a look. Let's see what's going on to my boy. Oh. You can't do that though. Pump faking the entire Miami Heat. How do you pump fake a free throw? I, and he got away with it too. He did. Yeah, I know Rondo did it once. He got called for it, but this one's oh this one's really God. something. They had pity on him. Yeah. They had pity on him. Honestly, it's a good thing that Marco Fultz revived. He, he revised the shot. You know, he changed the shot a little yeah. bit. That was worse. That's a it, is, it is a bit worse. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't think it works. I, what is that? Okay, maybe he gets maybe he gets it, but it's just what was that? I don't know. Oh my god. I don't know what that is. Oh my goodness. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait. So I'm going to free throw. Yeah, what is this? What is this? Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. Hey, at least it's not pump fake free throws now. Yeah, well. That's like it's not worse than Lonzo Airball. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to that one. Who's the better than like Marco Fultz or Lonzo Ball? One and two, one and two. All right, well. That does it for this, what are you doing? Uh, let's uh, move on to the next one, shall we? For sure. Alright, so for our last segment on this edition of Ballaholics, uh, we have one of the other uh, biggest headlines, I think, in recent basketball news. Uh, the Houston Rockets and Carmelo Anthony have officially parted ways after a tumultuous start to the season. Uh, what do you guys have to say about it? Honestly, I will contend a bit that the problem with the Rockets is not fully Carmelo Anthony's fault. Mm -hmm. I have to say, besides that one season, and I'd say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd say after he left the Denver Nuggets and aside, for the exception for that one season, 2012, 2012 2013 season, mm -hmm. Melo has, in my opinion, rarely ever had good seasons. He's never, in my opinion, he doesn't make the teams he's on any better. Mm -hmm. He was on the Thunder. Well, he, let's, let's stay with the Knicks for a second. What did the Knicks do? 
when he came home, we had this big, we had this big thing. I'm coming home. I live, I live in Manhattan. That was a big thing. I didn't hear that song until Mellow came back to me. Until it came back to the mix. Right. And I love that song. Now, I mean, I still love the song. Great song, by the way. And what did, what did the Knicks do? And I'm a diehard Knicks fan. And I was hyped. Oh, stop it. it. Stop it. I was hyped. Knicks fan. No, stop And it. I just sat there stop. and I just watched a nothing burger. <laughs> season after season after season. It was just terrible. And then he goes to the Thunder, and I'm happy for him. I'm thinking, oh snap, the Thunder. Mm -hmm. I, I I thought the Thunder were gonna would take the take the West, honestly. Mm -hmm. And he goes there, more of the same, in my opinion. He's washed up. Mm -hmm. He was very good for a while. If that, he, he's just in my opinion. He goes to the Rockets. The Rockets. So they they did lose a lot of players, but no one they lost were were key players. Well, they were all key players. No one they lost would straight turnover their team to be this bad mm -hmm. from from all, even one game away from being in the finals. Mm -hmm. And I just think that he's definitely playing a big part in their problems right now. Dante, so no, Dante. he's not getting scapegoated. You call yourself a Knicks fan. You say you wear, you know, orange and blue, bro, but now you're talking about Melo and how he makes all his teams worse. Listen, man, whenever Melo's on a team, it's never his fault that they're not good. In New York, they never surround him with the good defensive players. We know that Melo can score on the offensive end in his prime. But in New York, there was no one defensively, they didn't put anyone defensively around him to make him good. It was always about the fit that made it bad. Look at OKC. Yeah, on paper, it's cool. Russell Westbrook and Paul George, great players with Melo. With the, the problem there was that Russell Westbrook and Paul George are pure scorers. They're not playmakers. They don't make teammates better. Melo doesn't either. Not the best fit, just like in New York. In Denver, it was a good fit because Melo was also athletic. He could play and had many players around him that you know scored and also played defense. But in OKC, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. that's three pure scores. And Melo's good. Melo's best when he's with playmakers and good defensive guys around him. And in Houston, that was the perfect situation for him. Chris Paul and James Harden. Yes, James Harden is a pure scorer, but they're also really good playmakers. James Harden and Chris Paul can definitely dish out the ball. And Melo, look. We never expected Melo to replace Trevor Ariza. Trevor Ariza, I always say this, he is such an underrated player. He, he is an elite defender. He can shoot off the ball. Mm -hmm. He was great at shooting off the ball. In terms of fit, Trevor Ariza was way better. Mm -hmm. But no one expected Carmelo Anthony to you know, be as good defensively as Trevor Ariza. That's not reasonable expectation. Melo was the guy that was going to come off the bench and be you know, a shot creator and a scorer off the bench. You know, he was going to be a plug for the team. Okay. And they didn't, they didn't really do that. Like, they didn't really give him a chance. And here is my theory of why he got cut. Okay, mm -hmm. hear me out. Okay, so Melo in Houston. Okay, so the assistant coach, defensive coach. As soon as Melo signed in Houston in the off season, mm -hmm. the Rockets announced that the defensive coach in Jeff Bezeldik, who was who was, he was the architect in um, the Houston's defense last season, mm -hmm. he retired. He has retired mysteriously as soon as Melo, you know, got signed. Mm -hmm. Now, you know. A couple couple weeks later, right. we hear Jeff, Jeff Zeldin is coming back, and a couple days later, Melo gets cut. Mm -hmm. To make for to make it you know further even you know more controversial, mm -hmm. Zeldin coached Melo. He was an assistant defensive coach in Denver, and they apparently butted heads in there. They okay. butted heads there. So what I think is I think that the Rockets they really figured that they needed they needed him back. They needed Jeff Zeldin back, mm -hmm. and they were going to do whatever it took to please him and get him back. Okay. That means giving him more money, and it also meant cutting Carmelo Anthony. Right. And they did that for that reason. They did it just to get him back. For the team, Melo did not deserve to get cut. He did not deserve to get cut. And it was all done for that guy, Jeff Bezelli. Honestly, you think. I don't see why you and other Melo fans alike are standing up and the first money and get one of your first points. Don't talk to me to my mouth about fit and teams around Melo. You're telling me that Melo is, you're telling me Melo can't win a team when he's surrounded by, let's go down the list, surrounded by... J.R. Smith. <laughs> One reason I pause, because I don't even know where to start. This roster was pretty good. Okay, let's go. Come Tyson on. Chandler, mm -hmm. Mario Stoudemire, mm -hmm. Jason Kidd, J excuse me, Jason Kidd Smith. had his prime. Yeah. But he was still a playmaker, and mm -hmm. he, was still, he was still a great off the bench for that team. Right. Steve Novak, mm -hmm. Iman Shumpert, who was playing young, really well in New York. In New York. New York. Pablo Prigioni, mm -hmm. excuse me for messing up his name. Prigioni. 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 And Rashid Wallace came off the bench. Mm -hmm. He told me that he couldn't win with that team. 
And then he needs a better. He needs a better film in this team. I don't know what don't, superstars getting a better. Don't film name as don't don't name like a, a forty year old Jason Kidd, and don't don't even dare name Steve Novak, who's a bench warmer on the team. Let's look at Miami Heat for a second. Let's look at LeBron James. Wait, Jason Kidd. He's a vet. He's a veteran leader on the team. That he was a veteran he's leader. Say that Washington needs right now. Yes, not for talent though. Not not for yeah. actually raw talent. I'm talking about raw talent here. Okay. Yes, Jason Kidd was great on that team, 2012 2013, because of his leadership and what he did for that team was okay. huge. But in terms of raw talent, who was Melo actually had raw talent? Let's look at Miami. Let's look at LeBron James. He barely won. He won two titles. He, he could have lost the second one easily. Who did he have? He had he had Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, both All Stars. Name me All Stars who Carmelo Anthony had, who and were surrounded defensively. Russell Westbrook, Paul George. That's that. Again, as I said before, you, you're not yeah, listening to me. Russell Westbrook, Paul George. They aren't playmakers. It's, the, it's all about fit. Okay, okay. Saying that fit. Russell Westbrook is not a playmaker is a bit of a stretch. I think that... He scores first. And he's a pure scorer. He's a pure scorer. And he stuffs his stats, too. He likes to stuff his stats, but he can playmake. Paul George, pure scorer, he can playmake. We have seen Carmelo Anthony on teams with two icons, right? And, you know, having the same role as a shot creator as a player who supposedly should come off the bench and perform well for those minutes you know that he's there on the court for. The whole deal with Carmelo Anthony in Houston, I used this word earlier with Jimmy Butler, I'm going to use it again, an experiment. Um, I personally am a Houston fan, not to say that there's any bias here, but I think that the Carmelo Anthony Houston experiment failed. I think I that, not, not to say they didn't give him a chance, they gave him minutes, they gave him minutes. He, he, yeah, they did give him minutes. They, get, they gave him time. Thunder. They gave him time to prove himself in a system that was not going to change. Because what, how does the saying go? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is a system that worked last year. It's a system that worked Trevor two years Ariza's before. Gone. But again, exactly. I, I get it that you're saying that he can't fill the void that Trevor Ariza had presently. But I think it's important to notice that, especially because we have Mike D'Antoni's coach, as a, a coach who has butted heads with Carmelo Anthony in the past with New York, he is not willing to change his strategy around a player like Carmelo Anthony, who is, I'm sure you guys would agree with me, is past his prime. Who, at this point, isn't looking you know, to be the guy, but is looking for the ring. He is looking, he is looking to join a team that had, or hopefully still has, the potential you know, to make it far in the West. Um, granted, in my personal opinion, they did weaken their roster since last year. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, weakening their roster. You know, have, we we gaining players like Michael Carter Williams, Marquise Chris. You know, giving up players like um, you know, Ryan Anderson, giving up players like Trevor Ariza, gaining players like Brandon Knight, who is perpetually injured. You know, I, I feel bad for Brandon Knight. You know, I'm so happy that so he's there. He has good he's talent. Had, he's had a tough career, man. He has like a tough career. Yeah, like post <laughs> Yes, he he has the talent. Brandon Knight has the talent, but he doesn't have the longevity which is a problem on this current Rockets team because, yes, they do have talent, but not so much longevity in terms of injury, in terms of experience, and that's something that hurts them more, which is why I think adding Carmelo Anthony to this team doesn't necessarily fit him well. The experiment failed. I think it's good for him to find new pastures um, in that, you know, he deserves a team, or at least a team deserves him in the sense that he can fit better in their system, because he definitely can't fit into the system. Okay. You're talking about Melo's performance in Houston, but you're not looking at all the other players who also haven't been playing at the part. James Harden hasn't been playing at the part. Chris Paul hasn't been playing at the part. These are all good players around that also haven't been performing. You can't just put that on Melo. Second off, let's talk about OKC. Okay. Because I have to get there. You said it yourself. Melo is out of his prime. He's getting out of his prime. Yes. You can't expect him. He has two superstars now out of his prime. You can't expect him to be good there. And also, Russell Westbrook shows that he handles the ball. The ball is in his hand a lot longer than James Harden has the ball in his hands. That's where I'm going to go with you on that. Okay. I do agree. No, I do think that we can't put all of the emphasis on Melo. Um, any. But, you know, obviously. Any. any. We can't put, okay, we any. can't put any. But, however, uh, I do think there's a bit more that I can add to this. So just one other thing that I wanted to mention uh, as far as fitting into this Rockets team. I mean, obviously, you know, you say, yeah, we, we all agree that he's fast as prime. We all agree that we can't put any emphasis on him. But the thing is that the way that the Rockets structured this team, it's built around, you know, off consistent offensive performance. And I'd like to say consistent defensive performance, but obviously we've lost the pieces. 
Um, inserting Melo into this roster, assumedly, would add a bit more offensive power to the team. Look at the Rockets last year. Look at their stats. How they are putting out one of the league-leading you know, points per game numbers, but also letting up the most points per game. The Rockets offense and the Rockets game in general is based around scoring the most points between the two teams playing. You know what I'm saying? If the Ro like, it, it's, it's very simple logic. If I score more points than the other team, I'm going to win. And that's what they tried to do. Screw defensive, you know, strategy. You know, obviously the Rockets tried to play defense. Obviously they had guys who could play defense, but... A lot of guys who could play defense. Exactly. A lot of guys. But when it came down to it, it came down to offensive production. Um, and which is why, again, I like to stand by my idea that the Melo experiment didn't work. Um, Carmelo Anthony, would you agree, is a scorer. Carmelo Anthony's game is scoring. Oh, for right? sure. Yeah. Yes. In the post, in the paint, shooting a three, whatever, whatever it may be. Carmelo Anthony's game is centered around putting the ball in the hoop. Um, and, you know, the Rockets, Mike D'Antoni, they tried to put him into that same role on this team. Unfortunately, as we've seen, it hasn't worked out too well. Melo accepting a bench role, coming from, you know, I guess we want to call it superstardom in New York, in the loosest quotes I could personally find. Um, Putting him in this position and not seeing the consistent output that is expected for someone in that position, looking at what happened last year with alternating Harry Gordon and Trevor Ariza, PJ Tucker, all these guys, you know, I think it's a good thing that they let him go. Obviously, I feel bad. I feel like Melo deserves to get the ring for what he's done in his career. Um, but I think it's time for him to find greener pastures. I think his time in Houston, not to say that it wasn't, not to say that it was like terrible or anything, but I feel like it was needed to show him, right, that he can find himself a f better fit somewhere else. And where that somewhere else may be. He believes in him. Right, exactly. Like find like find a team that believes in him as much as New York did. Because New York believed in him a lot. They did. They believed in him for what, seven years? Seven, eight years? Something like that. And for him to find that team at this point in his career is vital. But where he may end up, I don't know. Where do you think he's going to end up? This is my fa this is my fantasy, you know. Yeah. Okay. But first off, wait. Before I even get there, I'm gonna rebuttal your point. I, 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 I want to ask you a question. Okay. First. Go. Okay. If the if the Rockets still had Trevor Ariza and yes. Melo was on the bench, do you, you still think it wouldn't have worked? I think if, if they had Ariza and Melo, Ariza starting and Melo off the bench. I think that so the whole deal with that is that um, the Rockets gave up pieces to work around securing Melo. Um, so obviously. Giving up Trevor Ariza was part of the plan to get Melo. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure about that. I feel like they want their first priority was definitely Trevor Ariza. They had no they had no interest in getting Melo before before that. Um, right. But to get let's get let's get to your point where I think he's gonna land. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with where I want him to land. Oh boy. Where you guys would love him to land. Oh. I'm, I'm gonna be the one to say it. That's I'm gonna be the one to say it. It's the Golden State Warriors. Oh, that is where oh, I would love to see Carmelo Anthony. This would make such a great storyline. You know, you have you have Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Jeremiah Green. That's the core. That would make now you add DeMarcus Cousins, oh. and now you add Carmelo Anthony. That's such a nice story. And like, it's like the, the, the storyline becomes, can the Warriors make it work? You know, I feel like they don't have a storyline. Yeah, you know, Draymond Green and Kevin Durant have beef. That'll go away eventually. But I feel like people say, you know, adding Melo to your team makes work makes your team worse. Let's let Steve Kerr try, you know, let's, let's see if Steve Kerr can make it work, you know. I mean, players there have had, you know, they haven't, they haven't played great before, and they go to Golden State, and they get a lot, a lot better. Let's look at JaVale McGee, for example, you know, he was out of the league, and, like, he signed with Golden State, and look at him now in, L in L.A. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like being out of the Warriors made him so much better. Let's look at Sean Livingston, who had a disappointing career because of his injuries. I mean, adding Melo, I feel like, you know, maybe maybe they can get Melo back. They can get Prime Melo back. I mean, not not Prime, not Prime. I'm not going to say that, though. Mm -hmm. Blah, blah. Get rid of that. But, um, you know, efficient Melo. Maybe right. more efficient. Okay. Um, but my, I guess, like, my more my, my more realistic place for him is going to be the Portland Trailblazers. Um, okay. I just feel like this team, they're very good. Right now, they're, they're number one. They're number one in the East. In the West. Blah. Right. They're one in the West. Um, but come playoff time, like, mm -hmm. they, they play well together, but, like, this team lacks... You know, like star power. They need to add something. They need to add something. It's too like, it's too unpredictable, honestly. Right. And I feel like adding Melo, while it's a huge risk, anything that signs him takes you know a huge right, risk. Right, right, right. Because it can make their team worse. Mm -hmm. But I feel like Portland has nowhere to go anyway. I feel like you know Lillard and McCollum can only take you so far. You're still not getting past Houston. You're still not getting past Golden State. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not getting past Denver, honestly, as the way it's looking mm -hmm. out. 
why not why not add Melo? Why not take a chance, you know? Mm -hmm. And like he wanted to go there at once, remember like when he was with the Knicks actually. You know, he tried going to Houston originally and then that wasn't gonna work out and he was right. targeting Portland. Right. And OPC came the way ultimately. Right. But I wanna see I wanna see him there. I would love to see him there. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be a good fit. Um, you know, playing guys like Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum, one of the best backcourts in the league. Um, sticking on that team, uh, I guess to play that role of shot creator. I think it would work there. I think with what Terry Sasso's going, um, I could see him fitting in well, you know, coming in after, you know, Evan Turner or whoever they have starting at that point. You know, if he accepts the bench role there, I do think that he could fit there a bit better. Just because the way that I see um, the distribution of the ball on that team compared to Houston, I think the Trailblazers are a bit more um, liberal with the way that they distribute the ball to players, with the way that Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum, while they're probably their high scorers, are not afraid to give the ball up. Meanwhile, in Houston, the way that it worked last year and the way that it's working this year, you know, it work to, again, the loosest extent that I can say that. Um, yes, Chris Paul and James Harden are amazing playmakers, but they don't, not to say that they don't want to pass the ball, but the, um, I guess, confidence in the players they're passing to um, has gotten to the point where they either pass to each other or they pass to Clint Capella. <laughs> See, I don't know about that. Yeah. I just don't know how well Mel will fit in there. I'm a big fan of Portland. I feel that. Not a fan of Mel, obviously. No, no. <laughs> is that why? <laughs> no, well, honestly, without being, being objective as possible, I feel like, I think arguably, at least my opinion, that Damon Lillard and CJ McCollum are arguably the second best backcourt in the West. And, and they're both two ball dominant players, and I just don't see how adding another ball dominant player to that team is going to work. I know you said that they don't really have much to lose, which is right. probably true, mm -hmm. but I think they do. If they get worse than this, what happens after that? What happens when they, they sign Melo? Like, what do you, what do you, what do you, I don't know. I think they do have something to lose. I mean, yeah, I, 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 feel like, I don't see it. Like, I, 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 I know I'm just like, I feel like I'm just picking stuff out at this point, but like, mm -hmm. you said second best, like, come on, let's not forget Golden State, Houston. Like, I do agree, like, they have a really good back where I, maybe, like, you forgot about Houston and Golden State. I was, no, I, sure. I was thinking about both. I, I honestly think that these two boys. Oh, you, 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 you did have them in mind. You, yeah, you said that anyway, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're really, you're, you're amazing. <laughs> I'll take, I'll take. Anyway, um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with the way I think it's going to pan out, honestly, th th this could be a hot take, this could be an unrealistic, you know, assumption. Um, Mello to Philadelphia. Could it happen? Possibly. Um, looking at, again, we talked about this earlier, we talked about the addition of Butler, we talked about how it helped the team to a certain extent. Um, and with Mello, again, accepting a bench role and the Sixers having the cap space after getting rid of players like Saris, like Covington, you know, and you know, having that, that money to give to Melo, especially if they want to try to make a title push. Again, because not that this always works, um, but adding Melo just to be there, just to put the points up, could be beneficial to them. Again, assuming that he does perform as well as they want him to. Like I said before, with Houston, he didn't, which is the reason I think is why he's gone. Um, but again, if he ends up on this team, it could work. It could. So four, four, four now. Four ball dominant players now. Yes. I'm talking about. Yes. I mean, look, I'm not gonna lie. Like he's a better shooter than the other three, mm -hmm. and I feel like you know, like I think you're completely wrong with this with him going to Philly. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bad fit with more ball handlers. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like I do respect where you're coming from because they could, you know, like right now, like what do they have to lose? You know, like right. they have Boston, they have Toronto. I exactly. think that could be a great team with adding more. Right. So like while I'm saying no, it's I consider it. Yeah, no, it, it, it's you know it's it's a fantasy. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. Um, if in the event that he does end up in one of these teams, great for him. I'm excited to see where he ends up. Uh, and on that note, thank you guys for watching. It's been another episode of Ballholics with Tyrone, Sam, and Dante. We'll catch you guys in the next one.